Chesil Beach is a renowned geological phenomenon. A jewel on the UK's Jurassic coast, Dorset's World Heritage Site. From the heights of Portland, the far western end of Chesil is almost lost in the distant horizon, some 29 kilometres away. The enormous ridge of shingle is up to 15 metres high and 200 metres wide. Where it meets the bulk of the Isle of Portland, the beach terminates in Chesil Cove. It is here that the raw elements of nature are felt at their most extreme. On a calm sunny day, the sea gently laps the pebbles. Few places are more restful. Heated by the afternoon sun, the pebbles can be almost too hot to touch. Sunbathing on the warm pebbles, then watching the stunning sunsets while enjoying a delicious meal and drink at the historic Cove House Inn or the Quiddles Cafe on the promenade is an unforgettable experience. Chesil Cove has always been a popular beach for bathing, angling and diving. Although the beach shelves steeply away from the shore, there are no dangerous currents and no riptides, so generations have enjoyed swimming in these waters. Breaking waves, generations of youngsters have found exhilaration by jumping and diving into the surf. However, when storms strike, everything changes. In gigantic waves it's impossible to battle against the strong undertow, so it is wise to stay well clear. Sea fog and storms have led to countless shipwrecks in Chesil Cove over the centuries, and that is another story. Two distinct types of waves affect Chesil Beach. The first are storm waves, which look spectacular. These are generated by strong local gales in the English Channel. Much rarer and more powerful are swell waves that emanate from far out in the Atlantic. The old fishing village of Chisel with simple stone cottages on the back of the beach is one of the oldest settlements on the island. The old houses here were built right into the back slope of the beach. By the beginning of the 19th century, Chisel had withstood centuries of sea flooding. Founded on the shingle of Chisel Beach, its survival was always precarious. In storms, the sea poured through the upper part of the bank. There is no clay core, as some still believe. Despite its vulnerability, Chisel became the largest settlement on the island. By the 18th century, stone houses, typified by the Cove House Inn, 
were being erected there, even on the crest of the beach itself. Most presented a stout gable to the sea and were built complete with floodways, not forgetting contraband cellars. The greatest ever disaster struck the village in November 1824. Late on Monday the 22nd, a storm in the channel began veering from south south east to south west while steadily rising to hurricane force. Residents had learned to cope with periodic flooding by seepage through the shingle, but this was beyond their experience. Before daybreak on the Tuesday, the hurricane, coinciding with the spring tide, threw gigantic waves cascading over the beach. Thirty-six houses were completely destroyed, and another one hundred were rendered uninhabitable. Twenty-six people lost their lives, either buried in the ruins or drowned in the surge. The sea had torn the heart from this ancient village and the effects of this catastrophe were visible in cottages still ruined well into the 20th century. It was four days before any relief supplies could be brought from the mainland and the suffering in Chesil was immense. Houses on higher ground were filled with evacuated people. The immediate need was for clothing and food but the fishermen had lost their means of livelihood. All their boats, nets and pots had been destroyed. Several ships were lost in that great gale, including the Colville, which went down with all her passengers and crew. The 70-ton sloop Ebenezer lost her mainsail and incredibly was pitched right atop the beach crest. It was eventually taken down the back slope and refloated on the other side of the beach. Chisel folk were well prepared for normal sea flooding every few years. They learned to sweep up and carry on. After all, the beach was their home and provided their livelihood. However, really ferocious storms did strike terror into the hardy residents. I'll quote from a few contemporary accounts of notable floods. February 1838. The West Bay presented one of the most awful imposing scenes ever witnessed. The sea came over the beach in overwhelming torrents, and the whole of Chesil was inundated, with great damage to many of the houses. December 1868. In the tremendous storm on Tuesday, it was feared for the safety of houses on the beach. Waves broke completely over the crest of the beach, flooding houses that had been built near the station. This time a very unusual occurrence took place. A monstrous wave was observed approaching the shore and instead of breaking into clouds of spray as is usual when reaching the shingle, it continued its headlong course to the top of the bank where it burst, scattering immense quantities of pebbles in every direction. This was a classic description of a swell wave. The island's beach road link was impassable. An enormous lake submerged the railway, only just built, and water rushed into the harbour with such force as to wash away the track. February 1904 Chesil was flooded by what was described as a tidal wave, actually a storm swell. The houses on the beach were subjected to a deluge of seawater and mud. This was preceded by a heavy ground swell, causing waves of considerable length to rush up the beach and to drag away the pebbles until the usually three-banked tier was formed into one long slope from the dirt down to the water, as it was described. The wind was actually from the southeast, so little damage was expected. And this is often the situation with swell waves. The report said white crested breakers came over the top. Houses in Brandy Row, Big Oak, etc., were inundated with water, carrying stones, balks of timber, and mud by the ton. Pebbles were hurled against doors. The rush of water put out all the fires and the gasworks. Every house at low level had its floor covered. The mud took two days to clear from the streets and the gas supply was cut for a day. October 1906. Heavy seas rolled over the beach, poured down Brandy Row for two hours. The street was flooded. Victoria Square became a lake. That was a consequence of the building of the railway station, which dammed the water back from its natural outlet into the mere. In January 1924, Chesil has been very badly flooded. This is not an uncommon experience. The householders are sometimes driven out of homes by the invasion of sea. The degree of calamity has surpassed anything in recent years. The residents were in real distress. An official relief fund was opened by the council. 
Portland's floods held back for no one. In 1936, the uncrowned King Edward VIII arrived to inspect the fleet in Portland Harbour. After the royal train pulled in, a sea whipped up by a raging gale broke over the beach and deluged Victoria Square and the station. His Majesty was towed into a siding in his carriage with flood water up to its axles, and he slept through it all. Next morning the King's car ploughed through the water, cheered on to Castletown by the rain-coated crowds. At the height of the war, December 1942, Portland had already endured horrendous bomb attacks when nature added to the distress. Gigantic waves crashed over the beach on the morning of the 13th, flooding Victoria Square to six feet depth. 150 houses were inundated, trapping many in their upstairs rooms. For a village hardened by such flooding, this was the worst in memory. Engineers confirmed what locals knew that the Admiralty and the Railway Company had dammed up the natural floodwater outlet from Chesil to the Mere and to the harbour. A sea defence scheme was drawn up, but 16 years passed before Chesil had its first protection works. In October 1949, mountainous seas swept over Chesil Beach in the night. Portland was cut off. The road was flooded and the railway line was cut when the embankment subsided and this engine dropped into the hole. In November 1954, a southwesterly storm caused quite severe flooding with several feet of water in Victoria Square. The island was again cut off for several hours, but national newspapers reported that Chesil Beach was breached, which was not true. The storm of 1962 also caused a major scare. The island was again cut off, and there was a major clear-up operation. The council finally resolved to tackle the age-old Chesil flooding problem and work started on New Sea Wall in 1958. The section fronting Brandy Row comprises a twin mass and reinforced concrete wall with the promenade. This has proved an outstanding success. However, a costly mistake was the omission of foundation piling in part of this section to save money. A storm in 1962 left a gaping hole under the sea wall when I took these dramatic looking pictures. Some loose fill was washed out, but actually there was no structural damage to the walls or to properties. The missing piles were driven quickly after that. The promenade on the sea wall immediately became one of the island's most popular recreational features. The last curved section in the corner of Chesil Cove was completed in 1965 just in time to prevent an enormous potential landslip which was threatening not only the cliff school but the road high above at Priory Corner. Storms struck twice in February 1972. At both times the sea crashed through Chesil Beach in gale forced winds and the island was cut off for a few hours. Two years later, 1974, a storm was again described as the worst for many years. By now, the worst affected area was always the Victoria Square end, which had no sea wall protection. The water seeped up through floorboards and the island was cut off for some hours. The sea wall effectively prevented any flooding at the southern end of Chisel. In 1976 and 77, Portland was twice cut off for several hours by the flooding of the square and the beach road. At the time, I was an engineer with the Borough Council. This is from my diary of Wednesday, 13th of December, 1978. Had urgent phone call, 4.30 a.m. Severe flooding in Chisel. On site. Evacuating Chisel. Power failed. Rest centres set up at St John's Vicarage and Cliff School. The beach road has collapsed north of the oil tanks. The railway embankment breached at exactly the same place as the engine fell in in 1949. A high pressure gas main and two HD electricity cables were exposed. Gas to the whole island was turned off. Beach 
crest has been lowered by two meters behind the Masonic Hall. The crest pushed some four meters back at the end of the sea wall near the Cove Inn. Gales all day, further flooding at 6 p.m. We organised clearance and emergency beach replenishment. Contacting police, navy and all plant hire firms in the area for assistance. Next night, 14th of December. On site, 1.45am to 6.30am, on the beach and in control centre. From daylight, the army and navy personnel were helping our men with clearance. Flooding again at 5.45am. 1.45 to 6.30 p.m. Organising plant to shift shingle up the back slope. Repairs to the road breach are in hand. Friday the 15th, all day. Plant moving shingle behind Masonic Hall and north of Cove Inn. Taking material from the back of the beach opposite the oil tanks to replenish the top of the beach behind the houses. Major clearing up operation. Repair of electricity and foul sewer in hand. Road reconstruction continuing, met Dobby and Partners Consulting Engineers re-possible future flood protection works. Saturday the 16th of December, massive clearing up operation continuing at Chisel. Some residents still away from their houses. Monday the 18th of December, continuing transporting shingle, moved some 5,000 tonnes from the flat part of the beach north of the recreation ground to the back slope of the beach at the Masonic Hall and between the north end of the seawall and the Lord Clyde car park. Reshaping of the beach completed next day. The sea on the 13th of December 1978 had nine metre storm waves. I stress that in dealing with those floods, I was one of a team with my council engineering colleagues. There was remarkable coordination with the many agencies involved, including Wessex Water, which later became the Environment Agency, the police, Dorset Council, the Navy, social services and many local volunteers. An even greater shock occurred on the 13th of February 1979. Like everyone else, I went to bed not thinking much about the slight easterly wind blowing offshore. The sea was fairly calm, no impressive white horses in the bay and no sign of any looming disaster. I could not believe the emergency call I had that morning. The scene at Chesil was utter devastation. Enormous waves had arisen seemingly from nowhere. They cascaded over the beach in torrents, washing down the oaks and the lanes into the street. Water gushed through the underfloor flood ducts before running like a river through the main street and Victoria Square. Some residents were evacuated, but most decided to brave it out. The stone wall alongside the beach road was flattened and the waves carried shingle down the back slope, reducing the crest by two to five metres. Although Chesil Beach comprises some 60 million cubic metres of shingle, it is finite. 
There's no more in the bay waiting to be washed ashore, so conserving the bulk and shape of the bank is vital. The folly of removing stout old stone walls was demonstrated by these cars parked up for sale behind the Chesil Beach Motors garage, where a wall had been taken down. Most of the original block stone walls in the area not only survived the onrush of water, but actually deflected and reduced the momentum of the overtopping waves. Pictures of those barred up wrecked cars were flashed on TV screens around the world and undoubtedly helped to galvanise action for something to be done. As in 1978, emergency work was immediately put in hand to push the thousands of tonnes of pebbles back. The height of the beach is absolutely critical, much lower and we could have been faced with an unrecoverable breach. Some even predicted that Portland could become a true island. What happened at sea was extraordinary. Huge swell waves raced from the southwest against the wind. Many of these waves overtopped the 12 meter high Chesil Beach, adding to the volumes that were percolating through. This unprecedentedly powerful swell was actually generated three days earlier by high winds in an intense depression centered near Newfoundland. This depression moved at speed across the Atlantic along with the long period swell waves as their energy increased. By the time it reached the southwest approaches, the swell waves were 8 metres high with a crest to crest period of 18 seconds. The 1960s sea wall held well, saving the southern part of the village from almost certain destruction. But more than half of the village was still unprotected. The 1978 and 79 floods were among the most devastating sea events in Portland's history. Those disasters brought action and a multi-million pound flood protection scheme was put in hand. An enormous culvert was built within the beach, designed to intercept flood water and to take it via a long monsoon ditch to Portland Harbour. A wall of steel sheet piles was driven into the back of the beach to block water seeping through the shingle the cause of most of the historic flood water. This gave one of Portland's most historic corners the best security against the sea that it has ever had. The work did not stop there. In 1988 the beach road was raised by over one metre to lift traffic above flood levels. Stone-filled gabion mattresses were laid on top of the beach and all this completes the beach protection for the whole length of built-up chisel. A new wall on the back of the original promenade will stop vast volumes of overtopping waters. There have been occasional floods since, but far fewer than before the engineering schemes were completed. The freak storm in 1989 when 12 houses had water in and the Cove Inn lost its stone porch. A Christmas party on the first floor was rudely interrupted by a gigantic wave crashing through the window. The old inn itself showed that it could withstand everything the storms could throw at it. Those old Portlanders certainly knew how to build for the conditions. The beach crest in 1989 was reduced again by up to one and a half metres at two places between the Chesil Gallery and the Masonic Hall. This was quickly restored by a bulldozer. This storm was caused by a depression and winds gusting at over 80 miles an hour.
I'll leave you with a few images of past sea floods. There was always a fun side. Some 45 major floods occurred between 1824 and 1980. That's an average of one every four years or so. Since the completion of the engineering schemes, there have been only two significant floods in 30 years and very much less damage to property. Huge storms will continue to hit Chesil from time to time in the future when houses will still get drenched in dense spray and the area will be awash with overtopping wave tops. The sea will still occasionally flood the beach road, cutting the island's link with the mainland, but the protection given by the sea defences give built up Chiswell the security it never had in its long history. Watch out for my other video for a unique close look at the building of the Chesil Sea Defences and the sea walls and promenade.